each night, night after night, we make sure that a slot is there for a prayer. And hear what the Bible say. Second Chronicles 7, reading from verse 14 and 15. If my people, that's we, which are called by the name of the Lord, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their life. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ear attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Tonight, I know that there are two elder here. I want the people of God, Christian, non-Christian, move to the altar. I'm going to ask Christian, move to the altar. I'm going to ask for my elder to pray. Pray for our iniquity to be healed. Pray for our land to be healed. Pray for this session to prepare ourselves. Brother Ken, Elder Bedford, come to the altar, please. Special season of prayer. The prayer team. The prayer team, come along. Brethren, we don't have all night. Please come to the altar for prayer. Elder Beckford, Elder Ken, Let us pray. Our great and eternal Father, who art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the blessings of the day that has passed. We thank you for allowing us to enter into your courts, into your presence without being consumed. Great is your faithfulness, your love, your long suffering, and your grace towards us. But as we approach, Lord, with your mercy seat, we ask the forgiveness. Of the sins we have committed through the day. Cleanse us we ask of you dear Jesus. Of all unrighteousness. Iniquities and transgressions. We beg you now Lord. As we lift up our country. Before that this time. That Lord Jamaica land we love. The people may turn their heart to thee. And the Lord you have said in your words. If we turn our heart to thee Lord. Then you will heal our land. But dear father we beg of thee. That as we live a life that counts and lift you up in the life we live, others may see Christ in us and we have led to accept you as Lord, Master, and Savior from sin. Bless your church in a mark where we pray, Father. Build a hedge around it, we pray, Lord. And Jesus, back, back the force of evil so that as we walk these streets, as we walk these land, dear Father, that Lord, the Holy Angel will guide our steps and the Holy Spirit will guide our path. And as we turn our heart to the Lord, we ask that you will bless us with a repented, converted, transformed heart and mind. God grant, we ask you for overcoming power, to overcome sin, the will to resist the devil so he can flee from us. And Lord, as we lift 
of our eyes and see you high and lift up on Calvary's cross. We will have that closer walk and relationship with thee. Bless us to this end, we pray, Lord, while we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. approach to allow you to understand and be able to read the word of God with new vigor, new vision, and a new insight. And we trust that as we near the end of this series that you will find that the word of God is getting more precious. We intend as part of our deliberate plan to get you to start reading, acquainting yourself with the word, and trusting the word of God. And we believe that if you continue to do that, you will be transformed as never before. And so we carefully choose the subjects that we employ unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In reading that, I will say at the very outset, that's a text that I want. If you're tired and weary, then this is the rest that God promised. Amen? <laughs> this is the Christian's rest. And what a text it is. And I repeat again, if you, you're here and you don't know this passage of scripture, you need to commit it to memory. It's one of the best passages that we have. I don't remember when I committed it to memory. Must have been a long time. I mean, um, must have been, must have been morning watch for Elder. Could very well be. I, I tell you, because you must remember that anciently we used to commit morning watch to memory a whole lot. <laughs> it, it is an Adventist tradition that I think we need to get back in gear. We still say it in church, but we don't really commit morning watch again to memory. It's one of those old traditions that we probably want, we should do a weekend or a night or a week and reviving the traditions of the church where we look at some of these good traditions that we used to have that are now fading before our eyes. But it must have been a morning watch or something. 
because it, it's a long time that I, I seem to have always known this text. Easy yoke and light burden. Touch somebody beside you and tell him he's going to talk about the easy yoke and the light burden. The easy yoke and the light burden. And in saying that, perhaps I need to give you some background to the text, lest you, um, lest you accuse me with insanity. Yeah, I, I'll give you a little background because I don't want you to tell me that I am insane. To call the yoke easy and the burden light. So I give you a little background to the text. And in giving you a background, we can probably read together from um, how far back should I go? I don't want to go too far back. Okay, we can start from verse 20. It's probably cool to start from there. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. This is a turning point in the ministry of the Lord. If you read the Gospels, you will be aware that there is a wooing note in the gospel. When you begin to read the, the, the words of the Lord and you, you begin to enter into it, you, you get the wooing note. The Lord is woo. And it's so sweet and nice. Everything the Lord said is so precious and so sweet. And you discover that the Lord is so tender and so loving and so kind. There is that wooing note. But as you continue... To read the gospel, you come to sections like this, and there is a change, a slight change that is taking place. And in some cases, and some of the gospels, it is radical, as in the gospel of Matthew. Because the wooing note is suddenly transformed into a warning note. The wooing note is transformed into a what? So the Lord, who appears to be so tender and so kind, and so sweet, and so loving, and so charming, suddenly his countenance changed, and everything changed about him, and now he's issuing warnings. And now the wooing note turned into the warning note with Jesus. He's looking at the people, after preaching the word of God to them and after pleading with them to accept his words and his presence and his gospel, but they rejected it. And the Lord seemed to be struggling here to find methods and ways and means to, to reach the people. And the pre previous verses that we did not read, the Lord said, how shall I lighten this generation? What can He wouldn't drink with you. He wouldn't rap with you. He wouldn't attend your social gatherings. He wouldn't come to your house. He, he was a straight man, rigid. You said you want a man of God, serious. Well, you can't get more serious than John. And he said, we send him here, a serious preacher. And then he said, you would listen. You, you said, look at John. You said, no, sir. You say, you know the problem with John, why he's always so serious and why he's like that? He's demon-possessed. He has a devil. And then Jesus said, after that, I come, the son of man, and I'm doing the opposite of John. Where John wouldn't go, I am going. Where John wouldn't eat, I am eating. Where John wouldn't mingle with you, I am mingling. And so the Lord said, we're trying that method, and it doesn't work. 
there, and now we try rapping with you and the chilling with you. And he said, the only thing you have to say about me is behold a wine bibber and a drunkard. A man will love him belly. Everywhere the food is, he's there. Look at him, a friend of publican and sinners. Christ turned around and the Bible said, then he began to upbraid, to rebuke the cities where most of his mighty works were done. So he's getting serious now and he's casting firebrands everywhere. And the Bible said, he's doing it, Matthew said, because they repented not. In other words, preacher, if they had repented, then there would be no need for this message. There would be a side of God that you would never know if you repent. Repentant people, uh, there is a section of God's character. If you repent, you will never know him to be anything else except loving and kind and tender and gracious. But now because they repented, now notice the, the text. Go unto you, Chorazin. Go unto you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. I'm not going to comment much on this because it's not my sermon. I'm just showing you the background to my message. And you, Capernaum, which have exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have repented long ago. It would have remained right there. In fact, it says, until this day, we are correct. I pause there because I must tell you that there are some questions that... that you can ask me, but I have no answer, so you don't put it, you don't ask me. Questions that are given, uh, that rise naturally just by reading this. I must tell you, don't ask me any question about it. I can't answer it. Okay? In Sodom and Gomorrah and all the other small towns of the place, not stop there after God burned it to ashes and nothing was left. Years later, an earthquake dammed up the Jordan River and Sodom and Gomorrah sank and the Dead Sea covers the spot today that once belonged to Sodom and Gomorrah. Both cities are on the water. Wiped off, clean from the face of earth. And yet Jesus said to the people in, 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 in Capernaum, and Chorazim and who were listening to him, he said, in the day of judgment, when I come back to judge the world, Sodom and Gomorrah, Tyre and Sidon, is going to get off easier than you. For Christ said, if what you hear, if we had gone there with this, if the story would have been different. Of course, uh, now that I say that, I can venture an answer to the question that I think you have to ask me. It is, no, you know, Jesus, of course, could not have gone to Sodom and Gomorrah or Tyre and Sidon with the messages that he bring to these people because his hour had not yet come. <laughs> the day of grace was just not there. But now, as Jesus is talking about judgment, and he's casting firebrands upon the cities, God in heaven, the Father, spoke to the Son. Nobody heard the Father when the Father talked to him, but the Father talked to the Son. And the Father told him some things, and we know what the Father said to the Son because of the response of the Son to the Father. The Bible said, at that time, verse 25, Jesus answered and said, he answered, but it's not man he's answering. He's answering, but you will observe it's God. He answered and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. 
But in the midst of it all, when Jesus is getting angry with the people, the father spoke to the son and said, son, don't get too upset. I am the one who is causing it. I am causing them to be blind because they are too wise in their own conceit. They believe they know too much. And they believe that they can run their own lives. So I am hiding the truth from them. You know, if you're too absorbed with self, you will never be able to understand even the basic truths of God's word. Humility, babe-like disposition is necessary to understand the word of God. That's why people can come to church and come to meetings like this and you can preach and preach and preach and they are blank. And you try to make the word of God so clear. And they, it still can't get through because so much self is in it. Well, we'll, we'll come into that. But after Jesus uh, spoke to the father, he turned to the son, to the people around him. And he, he spoke to them. And he said to them, all things are delivered unto me of my father. And no man knoweth the son but the father. Neither knoweth any man the father except the son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So he turned to the people and he said to them, Look, everything that you need in life, all things, all the things that you need for your survival, for your maintenance, everything that you ever need in life in order to be happy and sweet and nice, it is given unto me by the Father. The Father sent me here, but he did not send me empty and dead. I have everything that human beings need in order to enjoy life. And everything that you're out there grouping for and searching the world for, everything that you're racing through life looking for, I have it. But nobody knows me. Imagine the desperation that Jesus must have been in. He has everything that we need. He has life and he has the Holy Ghost and he has the eternal life and he has all the blessings that man could ever think of or need and yet nobody went to him for it. So he said, because nobody knows me. And he said, the problem is even more acute than that. None of you don't know my father. So you can't come to the son because you don't know the father. And, and nobody can find the father except whom I reveal the father to. Because I am here to reveal the father. But to whom will Jesus reveal the father? Who, is the, who are the ones that Jesus will give these blessings that he has in store? Now we come to our text. The appeal. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Jesus is appealing to them. I have everything you need, and you are restless. Jesus looked upon the crowd, weary and well-worn, restless and tired. He looked at them running through life and stressed out because they can't achieve anything in life. The goals are too far. The things they are striving for is sweeping away from them. He looked at them with all their burdens and their stress. And he said, the father has sent me, man, to relieve the burden off your back. But nobody will come unto me because you don't know the father. Then he said, you know what? Come unto me. Come. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You ask, what is that rest? The rest of the knowledge of the father. The rest of oneness with God. Jesus said, if you come, I will unite you back to the Father. I will bring you back to where you ought to be. I will restore you to where you fall. Come! Christ literally told the people that all of man's restlessness is godlessness. He said, the only reason why you're running up and down and you're seeking for this and you're seeking for that and you're grasping at this and grasping at that and you're going out reaching for more things and reaching for it is because you're trying to fill your soul. But the human soul is so big that nothing can fill it. No amount of money that you accumulate, goods that you stockpile, no amount of education, no amount of jobs, no amount of ganja that you smoke. He said, nothing thing that you throw in your system can feed the soul. Only God can fill the human heart. Come on 
come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us look at the text again. Jesus in this passage speaks of the one commonality that all, and if you read my text, you can see the two groups. In, it, it's so clear. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The, the two groups are outlined here. Not the first group are all of you who labor and are heavy laden. Jesus said, look at it by yourself in one set, a gigantic set with all the descendants of Adam. All of you are there and you are laboring and heavy laden. Life is still in you. It's pressing you down. You can't cope. And then Jesus said, but on the other side, here I am in a group all by myself. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can you imagine? Look at the two groups. With all the children of Adam, worried and stressed, fretful and weary. Every child of Adam has all kinds of things on their mind that is killing them and they can't have no rest, no peace because they are gasping for more of this and more of that and they are restless. And there is this Jesus while the burden is killing everybody. There is this Jesus saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You observe the thing that is common to both groups. Both groups have a burden. But the only difference is that Jesus said, your burden is killing you. You are bearing a burden in a yoke that is fretting the, the skin off your back. The, the, the amper that you have your stuff in is killing you and the burden is too heavy. But Jesus said, look at me. I am going through life too. But look how nice I am. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. <laughs> he said, I am carrying a burden too. And in saying that, Jesus is telling us that no man can live without a burden. Everybody have a burden. These people, they have a burden and the burden is killing them. Jesus has a burden. But the difference is Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I say this now as I said most nights when I read the word of God. If this was not in the Bible and it wasn't Jesus talking, I would never believe it. This goes against everything that I have heard from my youth up. In fact, if I should do a survey right now among you in the church, both Christian and non-Christian alike, most of you would tell me, no, no go for Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, I'll tell you. Burden. Let's look at this burden that Jesus is talking about. What is this burden that Jesus is saying is killing everybody, but his own is light? What is this burden that every man must bear? In saying this, I must tell you that Paul said something in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, Paul said this. Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen, brethren. You know that text? It's a well-known morning of text, and I think even the children had it recently in their Sabbath school, as um, many of us, about a quarter or two ago. Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And as you jump down to verse 5, he said, for every man shall bear his own burden. Galatians 6 verse 2. Bear you one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 5. 
for every man's idea is an emergency. <coughs> you see what Paul can say to himself? Well, it's only my appearance, actually. Be on one another's burden. And I was at home, and, and I decided to reach into my library, and, and I took down my, um, my, my Greek Bible just to look up this figure and to make sure that I am, I am right on target. And when I looked it up, I discovered that I was right on target. Because even though the word burden is correct in both texts, in order to find out the responsibility, the thing that is on your heart, you have to ask yourself, what is it that I'm living for? Because in every life, every human being that ever come on the top side of the earth, everybody going through life, everybody who has come to the years of accountability is carrying a burden, is living for one thing. There is one thing that is controlling your life, dominating it and pressing it through. There is one thing that that wakes you up in the morning, drives you through the day, and puts you back to sleep at night. There is a one thing in your life that is the master passion of your life. It is the master principle. It is the ultimate thing, conception that is guiding your life. What is the thing that you are living for? That is the burden that Paul is referring to. I wish this was a Bible class or something. We should probably keep Bible class in some of these seats you'd like to teach and so we can teach you and ask a question and have some give and take. I prefer that to teaching to tell you the truth because then we can address questions and we can throw things. I, I wish I was here to ask some of you, what is it that you are living for? What do you want out of life? I wish I could ask. I have asked the question in Bible class people all the time. And, and, and um, I get the same answers from people that are similar answers. You'll be surprised to know that, that the answers are always similar. When a man looks deep within himself and begins to ask himself, what is it that I really want? What is the one thing where if I get that thing, me, me all right? Somebody say, well, what pastor to tell you the truth if you, if you are level with me, you know. What I man want are some money. If I man get enough money, I man cool. Because why and I want, I just some money, and once I have that, money answer it all things. I man said that to me. Money answer it all things. So what I'm living for is money. And, and I, every day I go out, get up, and what I'm doing is strategizing and thinking as to how to get more money. And I want money, 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 money. Another person said, well, pastor, I, I, I'm really interested in money. I, as long as I have enough to go on, I'm all right. But I tell you what I want. I want some fame, popularity. I want people to know my name. I want to become famous. Man, if I could become a celebrity, I would be all right with that. <laughs> One man lived for money, another man lives in order to be seen and to be known. He said, I want people to know my name. My name to be blazingly plastered in the newspaper, streams out at you in the headlines. I want when you turn on the TV, amaze me. What are you living for? What is the thing that is driving you through life? Somebody else said to me, Pastor, I'm telling you the truth, you know, Pastor, I have all of them pick me, I know, Pastor, and I live my whole life, he pick me, them, I pick me, them, you know, Pastor. Yes, and them, everything, I got everything, I do every talk, I sing to every good. I just pick me! What is the burden that you are bearing? Somebody else said to me, Well, Pastor, I'm telling you the truth, I'm not really interested in them things, you know. I just want to, them to just leave me alone. If I could just find a place where I can just chill out and just stay by myself and nobody will bother me. Me all right. I just want some peace and tranquility and just stay there. What is it that is the burden that is in your heart? Why are you living? I remember I, 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 I saw a cartoon once. I'll never forget it. I saw a cartoon once about the two men who were 
friends from this mall. They grew up. And uh, one of them went to university, went to college, go far in a big school, become the CEO after years of a giant corporation. After a while, he opened his own business. I have many outlets all over the place. And he was rock rich, a billionaire. And he was there running his corporation. The other friend, see a yard, no go nowhere. Every week, him do what him and his friend used to do every day. Him go check up him, cook on him line, and him go a river. Catch him fish. And him come back and roast two fish and kill. After years, his friend came back home to the village and saw him. And his friends see him. And, and, and I said, where are these friends came out with him? Hook a line and go out to the same river. I said, man, where are you? And he said, no, I'm not going to the same river. Where are you? Come on, go catch fish. Come with me now. And his rich friend, wealthy friend who, 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 who is successful in life, look at him and, and said, now, uh, let me grab my thing and come with you. And he grabbed him stuff and the two of them were going to the river. As they were going to the river, Uncle Tim came in left a yard. He said, why? Well, I can't believe you all them years. Yeah. Me left you, you know, improving a life. You know, come to nothing, man. He said, look at me. His friend said to him, what you mean, mister? He said, look at me. He said, I left this little village now. And I go to university and get all my degrees. And he said, I go to another university and get second and third degrees. And he said, not only that, but I get big job and earn big money. And, 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 and running big corporations. And he said, so why you do that? He said, of course, he said, right now, I am here with my corporation running the business nice and going on. His friend said, why are you doing all of that? He said, well, I'm not doing it now because I want to make sure so boy, the future is secure. And want to know so boy, the thing called pathetic and thing. I want to retire. I am setting up myself so that I can retire. He said, retire and do what? He said, well, I want to retire and do what I always want to do in life. His friends are like what? He said, like, go fishing with you, man. <laughs> My friends said to him, but I'm not going to do all the time. <laughs> I said, you I'm tell you, I want a man to have food for me. But all my life, I enjoy the fish. <laughs> what are you living for? What is the master passion in your life? I, I remember I was, I, 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 we were talking about what, what we're living for years ago. Uh, uh, in, when I was in Mandeville, and uh, a friend of mine said to me, pointing to a man who was on the street, who always uh, do all kind of things to get money, always have big and rap down and do everything. And he said to me, uh, you know, Clark, you know, think your fear is a good one, you know. I said, why? He said, because look at that man, he doesn't have nothing to live for. I said, nothing to live for. I said, didn't I tell you every man I've come to him I live for? He said, yeah, but the look at Clark, so, you know, always up on the street, him drop down, him a beg money, him foam frat, him do all kind of things. Yes, him man, now I walk, him socially worthless. So, him not have nothing to live for. I said, you're joking, man. He said, what do you mean? I said, them, that man is a perfect example of me. I talk about. I said, what that man is living for, he's spending all his life, and his one aim in life is to find ways and means to no work. I say his, his passion in life is to make sure that he shifts responsibility, a shirk work, and no matter your try to get him into it, he determines you can't get him. And you will be amazed how much hard work a man will put in in order not to work. <laughs> Sometimes you see them and then practice the story where they go tell and practice it over and over and then practice over drop down and over foam and then go through a whole and a whole heap of work he put in in order not to work <laughs> but I, I would love to deliver you tonight from circus living by asking you what are you living for and whatever answer you come up with, incidentally, I should tell you that the truth of the matter is money and the fame and your children and, and all of this is, is not a burden. What these things are, they are, they are yokes in which you carry the burden. In order to know what the burden of your life is, you'll have to ask yourself some personal questions. You'll have to ask yourself questions like, why do I want money? For whom do I want the money? And you say, but... But, but of course, I want money for myself. I know for, there are a lot of us who, who are good at prayer. 
We pray every day and every night, but the Holy Spirit will take us and we fail. Pray, 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 but fail, fail, fail. We come before God, oh Lord, thank you for giving us your Lord and um, give me, 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 Lord, give me, 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 You'd be amazed how selfish some Christians can be. And no matter what is going on, there are some of us who never pray for anybody else except yourself. A burden that is growing. But Jesus, on the other hand, if you look at Jesus, we have been lived for self. And Jesus said, if you are living for self, you are, you are bearing a hard burden. Because you can't please yourself. You know, one of the things about self that I can tell you is that self is never satisfied. You ever hear about a self-satisfied man? He no exists. Self is never satisfied. Did you know that? No matter how much you give self, self want more. There is no man who can ever satisfy himself. And even if you think you're pretty and you look good, you never satisfy with the way you look. You have to want some more touch up. No, I hear about another beauty product on the market. G give me that one too. <laughs> Self is, is never satisfied. And even if you have a money award, and the more you get money, and as the millions go, you say, let me open another business. Let me do another thing. Let me do another one. Because I need more. I need more, 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 more. Because self is never satisfied. Young man, say I live to get girl. You are enough girl, trail a load. Even when I get two trail a load of girl, I make one out of road. No, no other one, no two. <laughs> Self is never satisfied. And if you are living for self, you are bearing a hard burden and you are serving a tough taskmaster. No matter what you give, you are more. It is an aching void, a veritable bottomless pit into which you are throwing things. Jesus looked at all these people, very worn and weary, trying to please themselves and to live for self, grasping at the things of this world that God had given. And they look and none of them is looking at God. And Jesus is there with his burden. What is the burden that Jesus bears? Well, you can just ask Jesus some question or look at his life and you can tell what Jesus is living for. If you look in prophecy, Psalm 40 verse 8, you will hear, even before he came to earth, Jesus said, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. If you look at him when he was a child, we are going to the temple, he said to his parents, receive not that I must be about my father's business. You know, when a man, listen to this now, when a man said to me, I must, I stop and start listening to him. Not when he said, I might, or I want to, or I may. <coughs> when I'm talking, and I talk to people all the time, but when a man said to me, I must, I start look, because this is something that, that God is a hold of him. Here is, here is passion lies. This is the thing that is driving me. I must. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. And as you watch him in life, you will hear him. I do only those things which are pleased in his, in his sight. He said, I, and if you have to watch Jesus right through his life, you'll be surprised to realize my need is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And even when, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, going through all the pressure, he said, not as I will. But your will be done. And the cross. My God, why have you forsaken? It is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Did you observe the, the harmony that synchronized right throughout his life? Throughout the life of Jesus. Jesus is the only being who ever come on planet earth. He spent all his life living for God and God alone. Totally 
committed to God. You say, Pastor, why you tell you all this long, boring something? Well, let me tell you why I went to it. I went to it just to bring you back to my text, the easy yoke and the light burden. Jesus said, all of you have been living for self and it's killing you. But Jesus said, look at me, the burden you're bearing is heavy. Every day you go through life, you fret up and you strategize, you try all kinds of things. But Jesus said, look at me, I am doing the will of God and I'm living for God. And guess what? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You say, oh, could Jesus say that? Jesus said, yes. Jesus said, the man who is living for God is going through life easy and is bearing a light burden. You say, what? Jesus said, yes, if you are living for God, the moment you start serving God, the heavy burden will come off you and a light load will come on you. I, I, I tell you something, if you decide to give up everything that you're holding on to now and decide to surrender all to Jesus, you will discover that a load come off your back and your heart start feel light and your feet get light and after a while you start shout, hallelujah, hallelujah, and people begin to wonder if you've got a nut, but, but everything gets right. You say, but I thought Christianity was hard. Well, let me tell you something. I prefer listening to Jesus than you. Because you have not always done the will of God. In fact, you hardly do what God said. But Jesus always do what God said. And he said, when you're living for God, the burden is light. You say, but I thought, when I come to church, my life going to get hard and I hard to live right. Well, let me tell you. The Bible said, I'm happy that you're giving me the word. That it's not the way of the Christian that is hard. It said it's the way of the transgressor that is hard. Let me tell you, it's while you're not obeying God that you're having it hard. To come to Jesus is to accept an easy yoke and a light burden. You say, but how could it be light to serve in God? How could it be light? What makes it light? Well, I'll tell you. When God created man, man was created as a vessel for the Holy Ghost. He was created to be filled with the Spirit of God. And he was created to obey and serve God. So when man decide to come back to God, you say, but if I go become a Christian, everything will go against the grain. No, it will go with the grain. Because I have to tell you the truth, man was made to serve God. So when you come to Christianity and you come to God and you let go everything and you hold on to Jesus, you're fulfilling your destiny. Your purpose in life has just begun. The yoke is easy and the burden is light. And Jesus knows that. Jesus knows that your life will start when you begin to serve God. So he said, come on to me. Lord, come to me. If somebody say, me think me have to do something before me come. Let me get some money, let me get some house, let me get one man, let me get one woman, let me get, let me get, let me. No! Everything out there will burn you down. Come on to me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. I want to tell you tonight, that the best thing you can do with your life is to give it to God. Your feet will get light and your heart will get light and everything will be all right. That's why this text appeals to Christians everywhere. Some Christians don't even know what it means, but it appeals to them because it's very good. This, this is Jesus' ultimate appeal. He said, the Father has given me everything. He said, I can set you up. I can treat you. He said, the condition you have, I can take care of you. All things are given. Come on to me. I'm going to close now because I don't want to go too late. Please stand. I can't believe the time runs so late. I, I was just talking about the word and the time runs fast. Um, I don't like these talking things. Please stand where you are. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you come from. I don't know what your name is. But I'm here to tell you tonight that the best thing to do with your life is to give it to God. The burdens that you now bear, 
gives it to God. I tell somebody I don't worry about my children and give them to God. Place them in the hands of God. Don't worry about your business. Put it in the hands of God. Don't worry about it. Don't allow life to press you down. Come unto me, Jesus said, and I will give you. Can't sleep at night. Stressing through the day. Come unto me. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And you shall find rest for your soul. Let me tell you, your soul will never find rest until you rest in Jesus Christ. I'm making an appeal tonight. You're here tonight and you want to say, Pastor, I want to find the rest that Jesus gave. I want to rest in the Lord. If that is you, I'm going to invite you to come to this altar and I'm going to pray for you. You're here tonight. Grey worn and weary. Tempest tossed and driven. And you want to find rest tonight. I want you to come to this altar. And this pastor is going to pray for you. For you to find rest. Rest can only be found in Jesus Christ. Rest can only be found in total surrender of the mind, body, and the soul to our Lord. Jesus preached and nobody would listen. God came on earth and nobody would listen to him. Uh, and, and he cried out, come unto me. All you that labor, he saw people and he recognized that they were dying with their stress, the condition killing them and they wouldn't come. Bearing this sin, pressuring this sin, going through life, and they wouldn't come. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Tonight, you're here. The Holy Spirit has spoken to you. I'm going to invite you to come to this altar, and I'm going to pray for you so that you can find rest for your soul. And let me tell you, brethren, you can't find rest in your wife or in your husband. You can't find rest in your job. The rest is only in Jesus Christ. If you, you are a sinner not yet baptized, I'm going to invite you to come to the altar. We, we are planning baptisms and we will sort you out and prepare you for one of them. If you are so um, inclined and you see that you are ready, we don't want to baptize you and you are not ready for the Lord. You understand? But um. If you're a member of the church going through rough times because your mind has been focusing on the problems and the things of this life and not on Jesus, I'm going to invite you to come to this altar and I'm going to pray for you too that you will find rest in the Lord. Because our God is a God of peace. He's a God that, that wants you to live stress-free. I don't know what is the burden that is messing with you. A lot of young people are can't find rest because they worry about job and worry about how the future will and worry about how they got. We want, what is it that stresses us out? We stress over almost everything in life. When all this time, Jesus is the answer to our problem. You're here tonight. I tell you, a message like this, um, a call to come to Jesus is a call that I always answer. I am with the Lord now for years, but I can't stop coming to him. <laughs> Every day I come to Jesus afresh. Every day is a fresh coming, a fresh baptism. Every day I start over new. Every day with Jesus is not only sweeter, but it's a new day with the Lord. Every day I start over fresh with the Lord. Somebody asked me once, how do I stay with the Lord? I said to him, the same way you come to the Lord is the same way you think of it, you stay with the Lord. It's a continual coming to Jesus. A continual giving to him of the heart and the life. A daily commitment with our Lord Jesus. Never reaching the place where you don't need Jesus. But every day recognizing 
that he's Lord of our lives. Okay, I'm going to do something else tonight. We are here at the altar. I'm going to ask those members of the church who have really hand on one of these visitors. I'm going to ask you to pray for them. Just turn to the person next to you and just say to the person, pray for me. I want you to pray for each other tonight. This is my last night, and I want it to end up in prayer. Do you understand? Just turn somebody. If you're not at the altar, just stand where you are and just touch somebody to pray for you. We want everybody to be prayed for. We don't want nobody to be left out on the prayer field. Just make sure you just have somebody to pray with. Let us pray. I want you to pray for this person that Jesus will take care of all the burdens of the heart. I want you to know that burdens are lifted at Calvary. And I want you to just pray for this person. Just tell the person what you want them to pray for. If you have a specific burden and let the person pray for you, then you pray for the person. Let us pray. And then I will pray the closing prayer. eternal, ever-loving God. What is man that thou art mindful of him? O oh Lord, we give you thanks that even in the midst of our waywardness and in the midst of our stubbornness, that you, Lord, stands in the midst and call, come unto me. We thank you, Lord, for this prayer call. Tonight, we listen to your voice and we respond. Tonight, Lord, we ask that you will take away the burden from our shoulder. Lift the load, Lord. Lord, we have been praying, we have been stressed. The enemy has come in like a flood. But tonight, Lord, we come to this altar because we recognize so we come to you, Lord, and we cast our burdens at the foot of the cross. We put it there, Lord, because we know that burdens are lifted at Calvary. 
We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus Christ. Tonight, Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus against every demonic force. That We plead the blood of Jesus against every demonic force that comes against victory in Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you will reach out and touch the unconverted in our midst and in our family. We ask, Lord, that tonight we, you will help us, Lord, that we will claim our children back. We want our husbands back. We want our families back. In the name of Jesus, we claim victory tonight. Lord, we lift up the word of God. We recognize, Lord, your call. Come unto me. So we come. We come, Lord, but we come with all the load of sin. We come, Lord, but we come with all of our burdens. We come, Lord, with our trials and our tribulations. Lord, we ask that you, Lord, Lord you, you will answer when we call. Tonight, Lord, we expect an answer from you. We expect a word from our master. We ask, Lord, that what, what the church board couldn't do, what our conference can't do, what we cannot do, Lord, and all the people that we go, what they cannot do, we ask that the Lord will do it by the Holy Spirit tonight. We pray, Lord, that the power of the highest will be revealed tonight. We ask, Lord, that our lives will never be the same again. We ask, Lord, that you will fulfill your word in our life, that you will make our hearts light, that you will take away all the strain and the stress, that tonight, Lord, we will leave everything in your hands, knowing that with Christ in the vessel, we can still smile at the storm, knowing that with Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors through him, through him that love us. Lord, we claim the victory tonight. We claim the power of the highest tonight. We claim the promises of your word tonight. And we ask, Lord, that as we leave this place, our feet will be light and our hearts will be light. And the burden will disappear. We ask, Lord, that as we go, we will walk in peace and walk freely and walk in victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Somebody shout glory. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody lift your hand and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody shout victory. 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 Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Touch somebody beside you and tell them the burden is gone. Yes, touch somebody else and tell them the burden is gone. Oh, praise the Lord. Walk free and we'll see you on Sabbath. May God bless you. here on Sunday night coming as we will have a series of baptism. So join us again Sunday night as we close off with baptism. <laughs>